there are a number of characteristics about the Y chromosome that we should understand to help us better appreciate how we're going to apply interpretation of YSTRs in, in the works. Now, the, the Y chromosome is a small chromosome, about 60 megabases in, in length, and it's got um, various characteristics. One of the most important ones, though, is that most of it is non-recombining. Therefore, each genetic marker that's on there is, not li is linked, and we can't treat them independently as we would for the autosomal STRs. There is a small portion that is recombining so that the homologs can pair up during meiosis, so we have proper separation of chromosomes into the daughter cells, but we, we're not going to worry about that here. Um, the one important point about y, is, y chromosome markers is that there's a tremendous amount of repetitive sequences on the Y chromosome. Therefore, there are a large number of the kind of genetic markers that we're very accustomed to and, and we understand well and we have the technology in-house to deal with our repetitive sequences such as microsatellites or short tandem repeats. The Y chromosome has a lot of these STRs. In fact, it's actually not a very polymorphic marker in that there are a number of, um, there are very few genes. There are, you know, uh, there are very few of the kinds of polymorphisms that are interested for health and so forth. But there are a few SNPs and there are a number of STRs that are of value. Now, there are some genes, but we're not going to go into them. Obviously, one of the most important ones that is there for sex determination, but that's exploited for other purposes and not what we're here for today. There are also are other genes that are very male-specific that have been found, but again, that's not our purpose here today, and we'll just pass on from here. One of the important things about the, um, the, the uh, Y chromosome is, is that it's changed a lot over over the millions of years of evolution from, you know, earlier species or, or links up to what we are today, it's diminished quite a lot to where it's only a small portion of what it was to its homologue beforehand. And in fact, because of the non-recombination issue, when an event occurs on the Y chromosome, such as a mutation from one gene to another, it becomes a recorded history. And that history is followed throughout the whole Y chromosome. It's passed on from generation to generation. So when we look at a profile, particularly with SNPs, which are very stable markers, we're actually looking at a history of millions of years of evolution, or hundreds of thousands if we're looking just for the more recent human um, um, evolution. Now, I've already mentioned before that there are a number of markers we're most interested in the repetitive DNA of the STRs, and there are about 200 SNPs that have been reported, over 300 STRs that have been reported in the literature, and one mini satellite, one of the ones that we used to use, if you think about in the RFLP days, which are larger size repeats. We're going to concentrate our efforts mostly on these Y STRs because, again, they're going to give us the best value for forensic attribution. One of the reasons we like the Y STRs is, is because they have a relatively high mutation rate about in the range of about 10 to the minus 3. That means about one in every thousand meioses, there's going to be a mutation where there's going to be a change in the number of repeats from father to son on average. It's going to vary from locus to locus, but across all the loci that we're interested in, it's going to be about that range. Why is that important? Because for forensic markers, this high mutation rate contributes to a lot more variability, so you have a lot more alleles and a better chance of differentiating two individuals who um, where we may only have YSTR data. Typically, uh, if we looked at SNPs, which you can see over here have a much uh, lower mutation rate, usually in the range of 10 to minus 8, 10 to minus 9 range, that if a SNP there's a mutation, it's very unlikely we're going to see a change back mutating to the original type somewhere in the evolution or various lineage to lineage analysis. If we have it and it's recorded and it's very stable and it's in the 10 to minus 9 range where one in every billion meioses may have a change. We're not going to see that for forensic purposes, so most males in a place will share very similar SNP lineages. However, most males will not share the same STR profile because of this destabilization from lineage because of the high mutation rate. So therefore, for forensics, the YSTRs are extremely valuable. This doesn't mean that SNPs aren't valuable. They're very valuable for more long-term or multi-generation kind of analyses where you may be looking at something several generations away, and we'll get into some examples later.
The main process, which many of you should be aware of from past studies on, my, on microsatellites or STR loci, that generates these mutations is the slippage process, and we just outline it here. We won't go into the details of how it's done, but basically during the um, extension of one of the primers, there will be a, a, a where the enzyme, due to its processivity limitations, will pause, and during that pausing time, where it's not elongating the, um, or extending the primer, it, the, there will be a relaxation, and we'll find that the um, extended strand can relax or loop out, and then when it reanneals back, it's out of sync and causes a um, reduction in the number of repeats, usually one repeat less than the, the true allele. This is something inherent in STRs. We see it all the time. And typically, for the STRs that we're interested in, uh, for forensic purposes, that's in the few percent to 10 percent, 12 percent range of the total allele, of the, of the total of the true allele in the process. There are many loci that have been characterized. We know what their repeats are. We know their allele ranges. We know where they reside on the chromosome. So there are a large number of these that can be exploited for forensic purposes, of which a subset are used for routine forensic purposes. Some of the purposes that have been applied for are genealogy studies, trying to trace some of our heritage to specific individuals, uh, such as the Sally Hemings and Thomas Jefferson case, where Sally Hemings was a slave of Thomas Jefferson. She had a child, and then her male descendants um, from her would have the Y chromosome if Thomas Jefferson or someone of his family was the father of that child then passed on from generation to generation. This became a big issue with the, um, the Jeffersonian Society, which was typically a Caucasian uh, society of descendants of Thomas Jefferson and his relatives. And the, yeah, as shown here, a uh, study that came, was published in Nature where his, the Y chromosome of the Jefferson family from descendants today, from the uh, European side, versus those who came from Sally Hemings' offspring, and to be able to show with SNPs that they were the same chromosome, suggesting that Thomas Jefferson may have been the father of, of Sally Hemings' uh, son, and then therefore all those descendants are rightfully uh, members of the Jeffersonian society. But we have to caution one thing is, and this is very important for forensic purposes, is it doesn't prove absolutely that Thomas Jefferson was the father of Sally Hemings' son. All it shows is that his Y chromosome was the same as his and other male descendants. Thomas Jefferson's brother, his father, his father's brother, all share the same Y chromosome, so any of them could have been the father of Sally Hemings' um, son. And the same thing for us. When we have in Y chromosome studies, and we look at YSTRs particularly, or even Y SNPs, all we can say is, is that this is this rare in the population, and all paternal relatives would have exactly the same type. So if a brother could be implicated or a father, we cannot exclude them. And the probability is close to one, if not one, in almost every case unless a mutation has occurred. The other, of course, is evolution studies, and we're not going to go into too, too many details here, but human migrations have been studied based on the Y chromosome as well as mitochondria and other markers because, again, because of that lack of recombination, we have a record of human evolution on the Y chromosome, but only on the Y chromosome. We're not talking about the total evolution. And this is a study from, I guess, Peter Underhill's work where he's done a lot of these Y SNPs to define haplogroups of, on the Y chromosome. There are 10 major Y haplogroups, and different SNPs will allow you to identify which of those haplogroups exist. And they're color-coded here, and you can see quite difference between the, the Native Americans in, in North America versus the Africans, West Africans being different than from East Africans, some degree, and Europeans. And therefore, we can see different haplogroups in different regions of the, of the world, not always 100% in one region or another, but predominantly one region or another, that can be used to help us better understand migrations going back thousands of years on the humans. Now, I, I mentioned the term haplogroup, haplotype, these become very important for Y chromosomes, as the same as in mitochondrial DNA. A haplotype is actually the combination of the alleles for each of the loci that are typed in an individual, what we might think of as a DNA profile. 
Now, typically for most of the Y markers, because there's only one Y chromosome per cell, we're going to see one allele for each locus, and that's going to become the haplotype. We treat it as a haplotype because it's actually linked. So it's actually many alleles from many loci, one allele per locus, all together as one. So since they're not independent, that entire hap haplotype can be treated as a single allele. So all the lo loci that we type, 12, 17, 20, whatever it may be, are really all treated as a block, and they're all inherited as a block. So although we're typing many loci, it's the same as only typing one locus. So we're looking at this haplotype as one allele. So because we type a lot of loci, we actually generate a lot of haplotypes because of the variation that does exist. So, but since we're treating it as one locus, this is actually a very polymorphic locus with many alleles, the many alleles being the different haplotypes. And we'll see more examples later on. The haplogroup is the categorization of these haplotypes. Certain haplotypes share certain features in common. I like to use the example of automobiles. We could say automobiles could be classified into haplotypes, being the different cars with the different identification numbers or special features of sunroof or um, sports packages or whatever. Or the haplogroup could be Toyota, um, Chevrolet, Ford, Mercedes being the groups. Or we could categorize them into sports cars versus trucks versus um, sedans as haplogroups. Something that has certain features in common. With, the ha with uh, Y markers, Y chromosomes, they're defined by certain SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and the allelic, the site and the state of that allele says that all these individuals belong to a particular group. So hypothetically, I could say SNP 17, I'm just making this one up, allele A belongs to half the group 3. So everybody has 17A will automatically be in that group. Everybody has the other one, the other state, in this case probably G, would belong to any of the other haplogroups. And we have these ways of dividing things up. For forensics, we're not going to talk today much about it. We're just going to show you a couple examples so that you can appreciate it. This is a tree based on the SNP data defining the different haplogroups. You can see up here we have a particular site defining a group of individuals separating one haplogroup here, haplogroup 1, from all other haplogroups, and then other SNPs defining this group from this group, and so on down the line. And this is just a breakdown showing it in a little more uh, enlarged feature so you can appreciate it a little better. Now, a number of things we have to think about why the Y chromosome has an impact with its way it behaves and the way it's inherited for forensics. The first is the Y chromosome has an effective population size that's typically one-fourth of what we see with our normal autosomal markers. Because remember, you get two from your mother and two copies from your father. But when it comes to the Y, we only get one copy from the father. So that's one out of every four that can be inherited or exist in a population. So therefore, the population size is smaller. And when the population size is smaller, we get lower diversity. So that means more substructure, something you have to think about, that there will be variation to a greater degree from populations or regions in the country or the world than what we saw for autosomal markers. Um, it's also more susceptible to drift contributing to that. So by chance alone, a population may have somewhat different set of profiles than what we see in another population. And so we'll see differences. Those things will be counterbalanced with gene flow into the populations. And fortunately, populations do seem to have a good amount of gene flow and mixture, so the degree is not as great, but it can be from ancient times to or historical times or prehistorical times have a greater effect. And um, the other factor is this one about what we're going to call the patrilocal behavior of men. Men have a longer generational time for reproduction than women. In theory, a man could be 60, 70, 80 years old and still have children, while women have a shorter reproductive uh, lifespan. So that means men or a man can actually have more children over a period of time than a woman can. Okay. Second thing is, is in the ancient times when you had a chief of a tribe or a village, they may have preferentially had more wives, thus more mothers, to leave their genes behind. So if you think on average that a man had 50-50 uh, 
daughters and sons, if someone had 10 wives, he's going to have 10 times the number of Y chromosomes left behind than a man who only had one wife or no wives, he'd have far less chance of leaving that behind. So we have these signatures of a lot more Y chromosomes sitting in a geography, hence the old, um, what was the one with? Till the Hun, Genghis Khan, who went out and pillaged across you know, Asia into Eastern Europe and um, left his Y chromosome behind far more so than others. His and his family uh, left their Y chromosomes behind. So you see a lot more of that Y chromosome than sort of the average uh, person on the street or the village at the time. So therefore, we see these pockets of Y chromosome existing for that reason, preferentially and that. So in theory, if you had a male leaving a lot more children behind than other males, the effective population size isn't one quarter anymore. It's actually smaller because it's a few males leaving their chromosome behind out of the total number. But because the females are not being selected, they're just across the board, you're getting really the same population diversity for the autosomal markers. Now, for forensic analysis, we have to think about why we want to use this. We've laid out to you some of the biological issues that will impact. We'll just quickly just uh, say them again. No recombination for the markers we're interested in. Um, there's a effective population size and, um, and lower diversity and substructure issues. These things we have to think about. Most of the technical side of extracting the DNA, generating the profiles, and all that, it's the same as what we do for autosomal markers. So there's no real technical differences. It's all about what happens after we get a profile. Okay. So what are some of the analyses that make Y chromosome desirable over autosomal markers? Well, there are some situations where we don't get a result from an autosomal marker typing for a lot of reasons. One is, is that if there, there's a violent crime, let's say a woman was attacked and she scratches her assailant, there may be some debris under her fingernails from the, her assailant. When you go and remove that, it's mixed with her cellular material also, and sometimes her cellular material is so large in quantity compared to the assailant's DNA that when you type it for, for autosomal STRs, her profile is 1,000 times greater, so it overwhelms the uh, picture and competes away the reagents. So you can't see the YSTR profile. Either it's too little or it's masked by the alleles. So therefore, if we had markers that were specific for the Y chromosome, don't show up on the X or any autosomals, it doesn't matter if there's a 1,000 times more female DNA. We're going to pick up and we're going to find the Y chromosome, even though there's an overwhelming female contribution. There's some cases where we have aspermic males, where they don't really produce sufficient sperm to be able to detect them, even with differential extraction, which will select for um, sperm cells over other cells and, and be able to enrich the different fractions for what we call euphemistically the male and female components. But aspermic males still shed epithelial cells and lymphocytes. And therefore, if we can focus in on the Y chromosome, we don't have to worry about the female contribution in the process. I mentioned fingernail scrapings. Sometimes we have just degraded samples, and there's just very little DNA there. You run it, five or six STRs work, but only the smallest amplicon size ones generate a result. Therefore, you'd like to try again with some other markers. This can add some power to help resolve and exclude more individuals. Um, multiple male donors in a, with a victim female background sometimes are hard to um, deconvolve to determine who the contributors are, especially when there's two or three or four people contributing. When we have a Y chromosome and there's two males, it's a little easier because you only have two alleles per locus for most of the loci. Sometimes um, we try to enrich, as I mentioned earlier, the, to enrich the, um, the fractions by differential extraction. And for those who are not familiar, the sperm cell membrane is, has a lot of disulfide bonds. It's thiol rich, and therefore it's more resistant to lysis than epithelial cells. So we can preferentially lyse the epithelial cells first, remove that DNA, and be left with just an enriched fraction of sperm cells. Sometimes it doesn't work so well. The, the sperm have degraded some, they're fragile, it's an old sample, or there's just very little of it. And so any kind of uh, work with it might actually lose DNA samples. So if you have a very small, limited quantity of sample, it might be better to move onward. Now, the other place where this is really useful 
is when you're dealing with uh, sexual assaults that result in the product of conception. Very often you're dealing with that same kind of scenario where you have an overwhelming amount of the maternal tissue uh, in an abortus. And if you run regular SDRs, very often you can see a tiny hint from amylogenin that the fetus might actually be male. And then by using YSTRs, you can actually fish out of that DNA just the male component and use that to compare to uh, the uh, proposed suspects in the case. Also, to, to continue on with this same theme, mixtures in general, we focused many years on violent crimes of, of sexual assault where you do have sperm in a number of cases to separate out. But there are lots of other mixtures where we cannot separate by differential extraction. And you can have sexual assaults where saliva is involved or could be uh, other skin cells or it could be mixtures of blood and other violent crimes of the same nature where these could occur. And so therefore, we'll always have mixed samples that cannot be separated by some physical or chemical means. And there are some gender clarification. We typically use a melogenin as a locus for gender identification of the donor of a sample, looking for what we'll call an X component or an XY component. So we'll see two products or two alleles or two peaks, whatever method you use. If it's a male and only one peak, if it's a female. But because of the nature of these tests, if there is a mutation or a deletion where the primers bind, we may not actually get amplification of the Y chromosome. It's not problematic if the X doesn't amplify, but it is problematic if the Y doesn't, in that some cases it may not be easy to determine if that is a male or female contributor. In a differential extraction, if you have a male enriched fraction or sperm fraction versus an epithelial, and we see in the sperm fraction a profile that has only an X, and we see a different profile in the um, epithelial fraction only has an X, but it matches the female, you can deduce pretty quickly that's likely to be a male contributor even though only the X showed up. But in others, that may not be clear. And by looking at other Y markers, you can quickly resolve that it's a, that there's, it's a male contributor. Now, we just have an example of a case, and we won't go through it here for time, but you can read it that, you know, um, typical sort of thing. Here's a profile where you could not detect any male contributor by autosomal markers. There wasn't even an example of seeing it with melogenin, which is the most sensitive of the markers system, yet by using uh, YSTRs in this simple uh, profile here. Very clean, easy profile, again, matching the suspect in this case, so we could not exclude him as a potential contributor in this case. Now, to look at it more in a, in a cartoon fashion, we can think of it as, suppose we had a case where we have a, uh, a profile from a victim. So this is a known reference sample. We should get two peaks on average for a heterozygote for the autosomal STR profile, any one locus. We have a male who should give a profile. But if we had a mixture, as might be in this fictitious case, you could see that one of the alleles would be masked in this, where the male is the minor contributor to the profile. And the other one may be at low levels. In some cases, we don't actually see anything from the male contributor, yet there's sufficient DNA if we can put enough sample in there. On the other hand, when we look at the Y, you can see that the female, if you have a proper validated test, should produce no profile. The reference sent from the male will give an allele. And then in this case, in the mixture, all you would see is from the male. So it makes it easier for making comparisons in these situations because the female DNA is not competing or masking the profile. Now, for paternal lineages, we can think of it for paternity testing. There may be situations where we want to ask some questions about the male lineage, father, son, or even further back, it may be an inheritance case from grandfather to grandson or some other ones, some, some kind of kinship analysis. In deficiency cases where, say, the father is deceased, but we have a grandfather. Can we make a linkage? Well, with autosomal markers, that comes destabilized very quickly because of the reshuffling and recombination. But for um, lineage-based systems where there's no recombination, we can go back many generations and see things. So we have an example here of a, again, a fictitious um, pedigree created by uh, Manfred Kaiser out of the Netherlands. And um, what we've got here is all the males are highlighted. The squares represent males in the pedigree. And we're asking a question about this, this one male here, about his father in a relationship who is deceased. In this case, any one of these males, because of their, they're all paternally linked, could be a reference sample 
to suggest that he is related in some way to this deceased individual. So this son to this alleged father or any of the cousins or uncles or whatever it may be could be used as a reference sample. One thing you do want to watch when you're doing this kind of work, though, is if you can, you should select those uh, paternal relatives that are closest to your person in question. If you, for instance, went to the far side of the pedigree where you have multiple generations, like all the way over here, to compare to that person, you have enough generations in place there that you should expect to find a mutational event showing up because each one of those steps from one generation to the next represents a meiosis in which a novel allele, you know, not necessarily a, a totally novel haplotype, it would probably be just one allele at one of the STR loci that you would expect to find different, but you can account for that. Yeah, and, and if you predict that you're using anywhere from 15 to 20 loci, where the mutation rate is one in a thousand range, it's going to be, you know, every um, one in 50, one in 100 generations, depending on the mutation of each locus. So as you start counting these up, it's very likely that you're going to start seeing that. And we'll address examples of this in a little bit. Now, here's a, another example of the uh, deficiency paternity case. Again, we've got where we got a certain individual highlighted. And bring this up for a reason. We have a deceased father and we're trying to make some inferences about this individual here where we're going to use the, the um, male to the right who is related to all these other males in this pedigree. And again, the other males are deceased as well, so all we have is this male now. But because of the Y chromosome and again lack of recombination and not too many generations separating, this is actually a good system to ask a question. So we've created again some, pr some fictitious profiles to make some points. And the question we'd ask is, is there evidence to support that this male here in question is the son of this father? Or this alleged male, I guess, in this case, or alleged father. And as you look at these, we see a number of mutation or differences, which could be due to one of two things, they are, that he truly is related, and these are just mutations, but the number of mutations um, doesn't seem to support that. Way too many. Way too many. And, um, and, the, and the other thing is, is that, um, or, or the other possibility is, is that he's just unrelated to him, and so that seems to favor it. Now, we chose this one um, in, in particular to point out this about the DYS3892 locus. We can see that there's a difference here of one repeat, but we didn't classify that as a mutation. And one of the reasons for that is, is if you, if you look at the, the um, let me go back one. If you look at the way that this is amplified, this is actually a tandem duplication where we have a primer, forward primer for 3891 that also serves for 3892, and then a reverse primer that serves for both of them. One product is encapsulated or incorporated with the other. So when you get a mutation in 3891, you're automatically going to get that mutation 3892. And the only way you wouldn't see it is if 3892 had a mutation that would cancel out the repeat. We'll, we'll cover that in a little bit. Yes, that does show up later. Okay, so now, as we mentioned before, a lot of these YSTRs have been mapped, and there's a huge number of these. And I put this up here as another slide for purposes, is that you're going to get allele sizes, you're going to get repeats, you're going to get sizes of these. These sizes are not necessarily meaningful from um, report or kit to kit, because people use different primers depending on where the primers reside and the length of those primers, you're going to get different sizes. So these are only are not meant to mean that there's a difference necessarily in the performance of them. These are just by the particular groups of Reuver, for instance, in 1992, had for DYS19 178 to 210 base pairs. We may not see that with the kits that we use today because they may be using different primers, but looking at the same site. So they should be compatible for number of repeats, thus number of alleles, but the sizes may vary on design. There are a lot of things to think about in the use of them, and we have a lot of effective guidelines, and as I've mentioned before, we're not going to try to recreate a lot of those things. We're going to use what we've learned and we appreciate and enjoy from autosomal markers and apply them. So a lot of the same sort of things about use and existing um, recommendations for interpretation, quality assurance will always be the same.
and we'll try to uh, use that here for same thing. So for instance, basic interpretation is no different than it would be for autosomal STRs. There's going to be a minimum threshold. There's going to be uh, uh, quantities of material you want to put in there. We're going to be looking for spikes, stutter, all those kinds of things will come into play. Um, there'll be mixtures. We have to determine what constitutes a major and minor. When can you separate them out? When can you not? You have to do the same validation studies, and your validation studies should be used to determine what your interpretation guidelines are. One of the first papers to really uh, describe well the use of YSTRs is this paper written by uh, Lutz Reuver, which is a compilation of the um, YSTRs defining what was known as the European minimal haplotype. doesn't mean minimal because of any quality issues. It's just the minimum number of loci that they recommended so that they can move forward for typing samples. And these are the loci that are used. SWIGDAM took those as a, as a base for compatibility purposes and add a couple more loci, as you can see here, to that. And so all the kits that we see developed today have at least a SWIGDAM minimal uh, requirements in it, but usually more than that. Um, I did do want to mention, as we did before, about 3891 and 2 again. It's actually two loci, but off the same primers. And then there's also 385, which is actually the same thing, a tandem duplication. So in this locus, for instance, we will see two alleles on average for that particular locus. So when you see two, by itself doesn't constitute automatically that it's a mixture. Okay, uh, this is an example with that uh, we, we said before of where we have the design of the 389, 1 and 2, and you can see we have a primer here and a primer here that would amplify both the 1 and 2, but yet this other primer, forward primer, sits between both of them, and you get both products amplified, and that's how you see both loci. There are many kits available, and that's good because it makes it easy for quality assurance practices and things in place and for standardization of tools and nomenclature and that for the community as well. Um, most of these kits have more loci that are uh, to enhance discrimination, and we're going to talk more about the number of loci because there's, there actually isn't a lot of gain in one respect by doing more loci. Since they're all linked, and this is a recorded history, if you have one locus and you add more, you're not going to discriminate a lot more individuals, but there'll be some gain, and we'll talk more about how that gain occurs when there's more loci. Uh, one of the kits that's out there is the PowerPlex system, and these are the loci in that. And then the Amplistar, Amplistar Y Filer kit has uh, 17 loci that are listed here. Now, there, there are lots of different tests, and we're just going to quickly mention them. Uh, is that we mentioned before the value of YSTRs, and this is just empirical data showing that when you have a small amount of male DNA, and we took the total DNA that could have been in a sample and quantified it and said, as typically we do, we put one nanogram into a, a PCR, and if it was a female sample that was 100 times that, um, the amount of male DNA or 1,000 times, it was one nanogram, it would almost all be female DNA. Therefore, if we ran it, we would see nothing but female DNA in the profile. Um, male DNA by itself or in the mixture has good sensitivity of detection. This is just showing down at of 100 picograms, 125 picogram range, we get a complete profile. And even when mixed with the large amount, 1,000 times more female DNA, we're still getting the male profile without any real loss, slight loss sensitivity, as you might expect in any system, but no real loss, and much better than getting no result if we had gone with the autosomal markers. Um, mixtures, just another example of studies where the male and female in different ratios, again, being able to work with huge amount of differences in the male and female contribution. Um, really good balanced results with both kits in that we're able to make some good interpretations on um, often challenging samples. Now, we've done some population studies, and we're going to mention some of them here. Most of this has been done with the Promega uh, kit because that's the one that we've done most of the work on to this point, but also the data today that we have Looking at the ABI markers, we see a lot of the similar kinds of findings, just we have more loci to work with. But the trends will be the same, so there's nothing to um, uh, that we don't see in one that we're not going to be able to extrapolate to the, the other kits. These, this was a study done with over 2,400 individuals. 
partitioned into different groups where AFR stands for African American, CAU stands for uh, Caucasian, Hispanic, um, we have some Native American groups, some Asian groups, and then some, an Eastern Indian, which is a very small group from Canada. The different laboratories are anywhere from, in North America from Canada, Connecticut, Michigan, New York, Texas, and, and so forth. The, Ari the uh, Native Americans come from Arizona. MN stands for Minnesota. And if you look at any one locus and you look at the allele frequencies at that locus, we find tremendous amount of homology or similarity um, for the allele distribution. They're pretty homogeneous that even though this is an example of DYS-19 in African Americans from different parts of the country, you can see the allele frequencies are very much the same. So at a single locus, we see very little variation or no more than would be expected by sampling alone. Um, let me go back for a second there. Um, One thing you've got to remember when you're looking at this, you're used to looking at plots like this with the autosomal losar, loci, where the allele frequencies actually matter to you with regard to how you calculate your uh, genotype frequencies and so on. None of that applies with Y. You know, this kind of information is very useful. It gives us an idea of you know, that there's basically no subdivision between any of these uh, individual regional populations and that some alleles are more common than others. But it's actually the haplotype. It's the presence of the allele combinations across the haplotype that ultimately will be searched against a database for a point count of how often you happen to see that pattern. Now, the allele frequencies play no role in that whatsoever except for their commonness or lack of commonness which can be investigatively used, but doesn't apply at all to the statistics. In fact, if we look at any one of these loci in this example here, we see the allele frequencies are very similar in the different groups. And we can look at another locus and we see exactly the same trends and another locus, the same trends across the, within major population groups, and we're looking at these subgroups or regional data sets. But the alleles from two loci may be entirely differently linked than other ones for population to population for some reason. A uh, really good reason that we look for this, though, is it's a good quality control check. Mm -hmm. If we started to see really different uh, allele distributions, it could be real, but it also may be that there's some typing errors. So it's a good QC check more than anything else. Um, allelic ladders look very good and they can be used, and that allows us a lot of possibilities. And, and this is actually what drives our ability to use these markers. We have a lot of alleles to choose from. This is the example of the y filer ladder. If you could have at any one of those loci, you have one, most of the time ones, in some cases two, of those alleles present. So imagine all of the possible combinations you can make with all of those alleles, and that's what is represented in, in the databases. And that's where the power of discrimination comes from in this kind of a system. Now, we're going to talk about some parameters here for comparison purposes, haplotype diversity, random match probability. They're sort of related and very closely related. And one is that, of course, the higher the diversity for the haplotype means, of course, more haplotypes that we see, better discrimination power. And that's related, of course, random match probability is the more diversity, the less chance it's likely that two samples, two individuals drawn at random will have the same uh, haplotype. So when we look at the data now from haplotype diversity, which is, uh, well, actually, this is actually genotype diversity here. If we look at each locus, we'd expect, as we described earlier, each locus, the diversity is not a lot of difference because we saw a lot of the same allele distributions. Um, but when we look at the haplotypes, we're going to start seeing certain trends, okay? So if we look at them, we're going to see in a population of 37 individuals, most of the haplotypes for this 12 locus profile are, are different. Same across any of these. In fact, they're typically in the 90-something percent range except for um, a, f a few groups where we might find something low. And in fact, I think that's actually a, a typo there or something, but it, it may be right. Um, but when you look at haptype diversity, let's look at first, percent single, most of the samples, the types have only been seen once in the data set. That's a powerful discriminating power of the assay. And when you look at the diversity, we have the, the haptype diversity is over 99% in almost all cases. And for all populations, except for the Navajo and Apache, as you might expect, because of the, as we know from their ethno history, that there was lower diversity in these groups 
few, fewer male chromosomes probably in that population. And we're seeing that same trend holding here as well. Now, when you look at it, this, we're showing that data, we're just graphing it out now, looking at the haplotype diversity for each population. You can see it's very much the same across all the groups. Note the scale is from 95.5 to 99 to 100. So we're actually just expanded a small region. But you can see again that the Navajo and Apache have a lower diversity as might be expected. And that really has to do with their uh, history. You know, you had smaller population groups, all those things that were mentioned before with regard to genetic drift and small population size play a much bigger role in populations that were historically a lot smaller. And they're also confined populations that don't necessarily have the same amount of uh, migration going on into the major metropolitan populations like you would find in the Hispanics or the African Americans or Caucasians. Now, we mentioned earlier that you should have one allele per locus typically because it's a hap haploid uh, profile because you only have one chromosome per cell, cell. But sometimes you will see multiple alleles, ex excluding the DYS385 locus, which is a tandem duplication, so you should see two alleles or more. Um, and these are just examples in that study where we saw multi-allelic patterns. So one locus by itself with a multi-allelic pattern does not necessarily mean that it has to be a mixture. It's just something we, we take into consideration, as we do with autosomal markers, for making interpretations. Now, what about equilibrium? With autosomal markers, they tend to reside on different chromosomes. They were bi selected that way so they'd be biologically independent, or on the same chromosome, but so far apart geographically that they behave as if they're independent markers. So you can multiply the frequencies from one locus with the other, assuming that they're independent, and be reasonably correct for practical purposes. But in the Y chromosome, we know there's no recombination, so it doesn't matter how far apart they are, they will always be inherited as a block. So we would predict strong linkage disequilibrium, a lack of independence between the loci. But we did those analyses on this because there is another factor in here, and that is there's a high mutation rate. High mutation rates could destabilize the um, linkage to some degree, and then it will be at least behaving as the random in the population. Why is that of value? We'll discuss that later when we get to the statistics. But, it does, but what it means for here at this moment is that they're not entirely dependent on each other, and there may be some degree of independence. So if we assume a model for statistics of lack of independence will be, will be conservative because it's not always behaving in that manner. So what we did here is, is you have 12 loci, and we asked the question is pairing up each locus one at a time, is in twos, do they show equilibrium or disequilibrium? And if you have 12 of them, that's 66 pairwise tests. So if they're in tight disequilibrium, we should have 66 tests showing disequilibrium or, or no equilibrium. So out of the 66, we see numbers of them they are showing no detectable disequilibrium or equilibrium at good numbers in these different populations, showing that there is some degree of destabilization of this disequilibrium that we predict. And interestingly, as, the, as you might expect, the lowest ones showing equilibrium are the Apache and the Navajo, being, again, less diversity. Um, more likely uh, haplogroup assignments. And that's a very telling point as another explanation what might cause this disequilibrium we'll get to in a minute. The other question you could ask is, when we look at the STRs, were there certain populations where pairs of loci always showed equilibrium or non-detectable disequilibrium across all populations or to a large number across populations? And these are some of those pairs that we saw that out of the 22 populations, a good number of them always showed, disequili uh, showed equilibrium. And why is that important? Well, if there's a particular locus that shows equilibrium, such as, let's say, 439, DYS 439, that means it's probably a good locus to add into your core set, because if it's in equilibrium, it's going to enhance the probability of discrimination better than one that shows strong disequilibrium. So, you know, in hindsight, if we had all this data when we're selecting all the loci, we would ask this question up front. 
439 is a very good locus, and when you actually do the empirical studies, it bears out adding 439 to the minimal haplotype will increase the, the haplotype diversity more so than when you add in an example of the opposite, a locus like 438, in which most populations show disequilibrium when it's paired up with, uh, with different loci. And what that means is it's tightly linked to them. And even though, you know, it, um, it's another locus, it doesn't contribute to the haplotype diversity much. So in today's world, any new marker we put in, we should do some population studies, ask the question, does it show equilibrium, disequilibrium? Now, what is causing this is very likely is that we can't tell what haplogroups exist in a population by looking at STRs. They evolve too rapidly. They don't have those signatures. We need SNPs. So we don't know what it is, but we're probably seeing haplogroup differences in here that's causing this, and it may be specific haplogroups showing up this linkage more so than others. Um, so what we see is that there is some evidence of independence between the loci, and that's good if we're assuming that there is none for statistical purposes. And it's a combination of what we met. The mutation rate could be some due to subdivision. It could also be due to some random drift because of the effect of population size. And um, it may affect in the future of markers that we should choose for our adding to the kits if we need to do any more markers. But there may be practical reasons we'll get to why that's not going to be uh, likely for future uh, work. Now, some of those practical reasons are when you're going to do an analysis, you shouldn't just buy a kit or select markers and move forward. You have to ask the questions, how do you want to use it? So some of the things are proposals that people say. Use a set of core markers, which often will be those that exist in a particular commercial kit because people aren't going to make the primers and QC them and do all the other work themselves. So whatever's in a kit. And then if you, don't, if you get a match, use more markers to resolve the matches. Well, this is sort of an illogical approach for a lot of reasons. And, and one of the illogical things is, is that if they truly come from the source, they should match, right? And if they do, you'll never be able to stop doing markers, right? Because the logic is that they match, you have to keep going till they don't match. I don't understand the logic of that is you work with the sample, you consume enough of it to do what you need to do, and you save the rest for retesting for the defense or whoever may need to use it to, um, to properly evaluate the work. And if they're linked, doing more markers doesn't always resolve unless a mutation has occurred, and we never know where that mutation may be, so you're going to do a lot of markers for very little gain. Okay. Second thing is, is for practical reasons, um, you have to think about quality assurance. Crime laboratories just can't pick a marker off the shelf or make it primers de novo at that point and start doing work. It has to be validated. It has to be standard operating protocols. There has to be proficiency testing. So you just can't keep going on and maintaining systems in your lab for trying to resolve something when we have good statistical ways of handling them, and you just put in what the significance is given the data that are presented. So you don't have to try to squeeze out power when the database size, and you'll see in a little while, is more limiting in the factor of the power than any number of markers. Okay. There have been studies done on the discrimination power of the YSTR, so we get an idea. And this is some work from, from um, Journal of Forensic Science, as reported by uh, Malero et al., showing the data with a large number of loci in a particular kit, the largest number in a kit being the Y filer kit that has 17 loci in it, and then removing loci to um, approximate or mimic other um, kits or recommended number of loci. And as you can see, you're going to resolve more mark, um, differentiate individuals better, have better resolution as you have more markers. But the gain is becoming smaller and smaller as you get more and more markers. But for each population group, we got going from nine loci up to 17. We're able to differentiate more individuals and then have a greater power of discrimination in a small sample size. The, um, the number of unique haplotypes, the same thing, will increase, as you'd expect, because you're resolving more individuals. So again, more loci is of value to a point, as we see here. Now, you can also ask the question done in, in this manner is, how many 
given these 20 profiles that were typed in a normal population data set of Europeans, they all had the same minimum haplotype, so we couldn't resolve any of them. If we use the SWIGDAM recommended loci, which is a subset of the 17 from the y filer or 11 of the loci in the PowerPlex Y kit, we would only be able to break these 20 individuals that are now in one group, one haplotype, into six. But when we use the 17 loci, we could divide them all up into 20. So as you're seeing, there is more power in the um, resolution of differentiating individuals by adding more loci. So the logic says more loci should be better. So we should keep doing more and more. But we've already talked about we can never stop. We're going to consume it. We have quality control assurances. But it's, as we mentioned, the size of the database is actually very important. So consider um, this, and I think you know, I'll, I'll leave this and then let you talk some, is if I had a database of 100 individuals and each of the Y haplotypes were different, the mo if I had a case sample, the most that could ever be in searching that database is I'd see one hit or no hits in that data set. And let's say it was nine loci. Now, let's say I get a match between the evidence and a known sample, so now I type 50 more loci. I can still get no more power of discrimination because I only have 100 individuals in the database. It can still only be zero or one out of 100. So I've improved nothing in my ability to get better power on statistics by adding more loci. I have to increase the size of the database to get a more precise estimate of that. All these profiles in that 100 individuals may be exceedingly rare. Just by chance, they're just the ones we selected out and, and individuals. But if I increase the database to 1,000 and they're all still only seen once, I can at least say I've seen them zero or one out of 1,000 times and then correct for sampling on that, as opposed to seeing zero out of 100, one out of 100 times correct for that. I get an order of magnitude in my discrimination power to to infer the rarity of the profile by increasing the database size. Right. Mm -hmm. and, you know, when you're looking at something like this, this is what we're dealing with right now with the database that has the most loci and the highest number of individuals. And you can see that even in this database, I don't know where my little pointer is, you know, our, our total in the database is only 3,561 individuals. You know, that looks like a big number. You know, you've got to think of what you're used to with the autosomal STRs, the uh, SWIGDAM databases that you have in PopStats and the CODA software have about 200 individuals in it. Well, this is, you know, quite a bit more than that. But yet, this is a very, very small database size when we're talking about haplotypes. We're looking at basically the same thing with mitochondrial DNA. We have a database of about 5,000 individuals. And it's not necessarily useful to try to type more, you know, like Bruce was saying, if the database doesn't also contain those markers. With sequence, it's easy. You're always sequencing the same reason, region, but in this case here with YSDRs, adding additional markers and not having a database that supports the entire haplotype, okay? All of the markers that you want to test have to be tested off the same sample in every individual in this database to make it work. And a large data set. And, a, and having a large data set. I mean, you could easily put a zero, preferably two zeros at the end of this number before you could really say you have a good, solid data set where you're seeing a lot of the haplotypes that are available. Let, let me add just one thing here. Um, that doesn't mean that the database you have is not appropriate for use. No, not at all. In fact, most of the time you're going to have a very conservative estimate because the sampling is going to be low. So we're always correcting upward for sampling so that the common types and the rare types will actually have much more common value. But if you want precision to get more to the true values in the population, you need a much larger sample size. Now, we can look at this in terms of, you know, ultimately what we want in the courts is to give some kind of a frequency value, some kind of a statistic to give weight to when we say from our observation that we have a match between two particular, particular profiles. And if we look at this, we can break down that data from that uh, chart for our 20 individuals. 20 individuals that if we were looking at just that European minimal haplotype, they were unresolvable. You know, with, with the addition of the SWIGDAM loci, uh, we broke it down into six different groupings. 
with the full panel from Y filer with the 17 loci, we can actually di differentiate between those 20 individuals that were undifferentiatable with the European amenable. Well, what, does, what are we actually talking about here? Well, how many individuals are sharing haplotypes? With the European minimal, it was 20. With the addition of the Swigdam loci, we had a group of seven, a group of six, and a group of four, and of course, none with the Y filer. What does this make for our point estimate? Remember, we're basing our frequency in this case not on allele frequencies or anything like that, but on how often we see a particular pattern of alleles in the database. Our database size of 3561, we get a raw point estimate for the European minimal haplotype for those 20 people, 0 0.0056. And then we can see with the swig dam additions, those groups of individuals, those 20 individuals broken down into seven individuals, six and four and so on. You know, we're dropping it down to 0 0.001 roughly, between 0 0.001 and 0 0.002. And then with the Y filer, we drop it down to 0 0.0002. So in this sense here, the additional of those loci with the given database size that we have available, you know, that's about as good as it's going to get. Anytime we find a particular uh, haplotype only a single time in the database, you know, we're going to be looking at a number that's roughly down in this particular range. Okay, so the database size can be the driving factor. And here's an example of how that works. Say our database size was only 1,000 individuals. How would that affect what our point estimate frequency would, would be? Well, we can see with fewer individuals, we take a serious hit in terms of what our evaluation of the, you know, supposed rarity of that particular haplotype would be. Even in our Y filer system with 17 loci, it drops from 0 0.0028 down to 0 0.001 based on database size. It doesn't matter how many particular loci we typed in that regard. So that really becomes the driving factor for our statistics. So where are we? Okay. okay, we want to just caution on one thing is that the example we gave is not to mean that you just do a database search with the 3,000 and change. It's just an no. example to show you the value. You want to look at it in each population group to get that value. So don't take this as a meaningful. So let's go through how we would do this. So we're, um, we're, we're going to go into this and see what happens. Um, we're unlikely to add more loci because the gain is low after a certain point and that many, many samples will already be very limited in their quantity. So we're not going to be retyping them for many loci because you're going to consume all of them in the first shot or in, uh, save some over uh, for, for future testing. Um, we said that the community rely on commercial kits. You know, we have this constraint with QC and proficiency testing and standard operating protocols. And that it would be really powerful to increase the database size. So a lot of effort needs to be done in that if we want to really achieve or gain some power in discrimination. And we'll revisit this substructure issue later when we come to where more loci may actually be helpful. Okay, now, another thing is, is um, some people may suggest that a reference database should contain related individuals to be whatever it's like in the neighborhood or the region where it came from to better define that population. Um, the problem with that is, is it may not be helpful, nor can we ever actually produce a database like that because it would have to be a designer database and you can't go out and just specifically say, I want this relative in there and this relative or whatever. But what is it we're trying to answer? The question we're trying to answer is, is if you have a paternal relative that could be the source of the sample, suppose a man is uh, accused of a crime and there is a, an alibi sufficient enough to suggest that his brother could have also been the, a potential perpetrator. Well, if we type his Y chromosome, the man's, and the evidence and they match, and we say, what's the probability, given the man has this particular type, that his brother would have that type, the probability is going to be one. Therefore, we already know the answer to the relative scenario. All paternal relatives, for all intents and purposes, have a probability of one, barring a mutation. If we say it's unrelated individuals, and we attempt to try to do that as best we can, then we're going to be able to answer other questions as well. What's the chance of seeing it in non-paternally related individuals? 
and in some scenarios where we have the question of two closely related profiles, we want to know is we have a hypothesis that could this come from a paternal relative at some level or a hypothesis of that it comes from an unrelated individual. We can look at the probability evidence under those two hypotheses and weigh them out if we have a database of unrelated individuals. So it really is better to deal with that. So for example, in this case here, we have a hypothetical profile of evidence and a hypothetical of known, and we search and we say, hmm, we have a known sample, Can't, he's excluded because we have this one difference from the blood sample found at the crime scene, but it's only one repeat away, and all the other loci are the same, could it be from a paternal relative? Well, we can weigh that out if we have those kinds of databases generated. Now, when we look at interpretations, there are some things we can do without statistics or any value databases. The obvious one is exclusion. You can look at them and say they could not be from the same source. And inclusion or match, and you need to define these terms what they mean, but basically is, is the profiles are such that the um, individual cannot be excluded as a donor of the sample or anyone of that same common paternal Eternal lineage cannot be excluded as a sample, and we strongly suggest that that kind of language be used every time when uh -huh. the, describing evidence of this nature so that it's not misinterpreted and overweighted from what it is. And then there's inconclusive, which is a whole range of possibilities, but we just don't have sufficient information to render an interpretation at this time. So let's think next. To recap some of the things we said as we can proceed onward is that We've got this recording of the history, even with YSTRs to more recent history, but some recording of that chromosome. We have a smaller effective population size because of substructure. The patrilineal, inher patrilineal inheritance reduces that population size somewhat more, and so that variance in offspring is going to be reduced accordingly. And we're going to get this localized effect that's going to cause some substructure in it. And we've got that lack of recombination, which is also going to keep and maintain that substructure to some degree. But we do have some destabilization of that disequilibrium, so it's not completely independent. So now, what are we confronted with? As John has already mentioned, we're interested in conveying to the court something about the significance of this finding that two samples match or that this sample cannot be excluded as a contributor of a mixture or whatever it may be. And the court is used to receiving frequency estimates, because that's what you get with autosomal STRs. But a frequency estimate, as we've seen, is not possible. All we can say is, is that we haven't seen it in this database or we've seen it X number of times in the database. And the size of the database is going to be a much more limiting factor than whatever the, the frequency is in the population. So we can't give a frequency estimate with the data and the, si and the limited size of databases we have today. And yet the court wants you to give a frequency estimate, so we have a dilemma. Well, what's typically done is, is, and this is just a statement of fact, say how many times do I see this in my database? No special math involved in this, it's just counting. You know, the, probably the oldest statistic ever used is to count how many times I see something. So you can say I've seen it zero, one, two, or three times out of n number of individuals. And then you can say, I can, but I'm concerned about sampling, and therefore um, by chance I may not have sampled this well enough and we're only worried about if it was more common in the population than what we sampled. So therefore, we want to pump it up a little bit with a confidence interval. Mm -hmm. And another thing is, is this approach we're using is good because it's similar to what's being used in mitochondrial DNA. So there's already a tried, true process. It's been through the legal systems. It's well understood. And here, here's the value of it. We can never tell you what the true frequency estimate is. But with this, we can say with this value, we have a high degree of confidence that the frequency is no greater than this upper bound value that we got by the counting method. So it's a very conservative approach. So we're not saying if I give you a value of 1 in 1,000 or 1 in 300 or whatever the number may be, that that's the true frequency. You're saying is we have confidence that the frequency would be no higher than this. Okay, now. We know it's performed differently in autosomal. We've already mentioned we're using this counting method through a haplotype and not each individual locus and then multiplying the frequencies together. Um, we don't employ the product rule at all. 
And we're treating the entire profile as a single locus. So when we count, we're counting the entire haplotype. And it's very important we understand that. Now, another limitation is because, there's, as John mentioned earlier, we have a lot of alleles, there's a lot of possible combinations. Some of the possible combinations will never be seen because they don't exist because of linkage disequilibrium with some of the alleles, but many of them we've never seen because the databases aren't large enough and sampled at this point. So there'll be examples of things in our data set where we search, we just won't see that type. So many of the possible haplotypes will never be observed in a database. So because of that, with a smaller database, the counting method and the upper confidence level are almost always going to be more conservative than the true value in the process. We also need to think about substructure because we do have these localized effects and this, this differential um, or preferential uh, deposition of Y chromosomes by some males in historical times at least. So we predict and we actually um, we actually encourage you to use the counting method because it is simple, it's operational, it's been used before, and it's, um, it's an understandable, and it deals with the degree of linkage that may exist in these different ones. Now, there are some limits to the counting method. We just want to say is, is that, you know, we're, we're um, not giving all the value, and we're not dealing with the substructure effects, which actually could actually give us more power. We're throwing some of that out. If there's a mutation, some mutations can be weighted more than others, given the locus, the number of repeats away from that particular allele. Mm -hmm. Really, you know, one of the things you got to consider when we look at this thing forensically, you know, if two haplotypes are different, you know, one, at one locus where one's a 12 and one's a 14 or a 13 or anything like that, we don't care what the difference between those are. We just know that they're different. Evolutionarily, it might be of some significance if one is a 12 and the next one's a 13, but for our purposes, that isn't, and that's why they're not weighted differently. And again, the mutations, if we understand those better, we could actually exclude some in certain mm -hmm. situations as we describe here. Um, and then we're not going to deal with the evolutionary changes or convergent mutations that could actually be more power that could be extracted out to make better predictions. So we're using a very conservative me uh, method for estimates, and that's going to be a powerful way of, of dealing with this. Now, we know that we have a Y haplotype. It's not been seen in a database of N males, and we're going to have a certain level of significance, say 95% confidence interval or whatever. We can calculate out what that frequency will be using this formula for when we don't see any males or any profiles matching any males in the data set. And um, as the database comes larger, we're going to get closer to the point estimate. So a larger data set is going to make that a more precise estimate. And um, this is why we want to drive it towards larger data sets. So if we can, again, it doesn't mean we can't use what we have, but we're just going to have greater bounds on our, our um, confidence interval and more conservative estimates. And just examples of what it would be if we had a value of a database of 100 and we didn't see anything in it, we'd have an estimate of about 3%. If we have 500, it'd be 0 .006 and so on up the line. It can never get any better than that with these sample sizes per se, but you can see one thing. As the sample size becomes larger, and if it truly was not seen but very rare in that data set, the values are going to become orders of magnitude better as the database becomes larger. Now, Basically, in a counting method, we're going to figure out this observed frequency as the number of times seen in the database over the total size of the database. And we're using right now, in assuming a, n a normality, this confidence interval approach for when we've seen it in the database once, twice, or how many other times. This is a very conservative one, and actually there are better, um, better methods for it, but because it's conservative and can be done manually, We've selected for this, and it's all right as long as it's a broader estimate for this time frame. Um, we've already mentioned this, so we'll skip. Now, this is just an example of some other theories that would give us better estimates, a little more precise for the upper confidence limit, that we may pursue in the future to so let you know it doesn't have to assume that it's normally distributed, which these profiles are not. Okay, now. We know that there's population substructure. We know that we have this effective population size again. 
And we know that substructure will be more so than we've seen for the autosomal markers, which has been very, very low. And so we have to deal with the situations when the reference database may not be representative. So we're going to use one database and extrapolate. And the one thing you really have to uh, remember, especially with U.S. populations, that most all of the populations that we're calling in the U.S. are admixed populations, and where if you went back to core areas in, say, Eastern Europe or Africa or, you know, the central portions of Asia, where you'd find the more historical populations, there are much less admixture going on there, and actually you're going to find the substructure effect being much greatly enhanced compared to what we would see in the cosmopolitan, the more panmictic populations we have in the U.S. and other ma ma major uh, population areas, uh, Europe, uh, Great Britain, Spain, Mexico City, you know, places like that. Okay, now, the reason that we have some concern, though, is that there are pockets, even in the U.S. and other places where these may exist, mm -hmm. we just haven't typed them yet. And it's an argument that will always arise, and it's a legitimate argument to an extent that has to be addressed. Now, the reason is, is that if we're using a database where we see in this database a particular haplotype that's very common, but we use it for a, a, a situation that's not really absolutely representative of the situation. There may be other types that are more common, and if we did that, we might give a wrong value. And if we didn't overestimate the value to be conservative, we could mislead about the significance of it. First of all, that's probably not going to happen with these, because as you can see, with 17 loci, or in that range, you know, 12, 17 loci, most of them are single observations in the data sets, so all of them are rare. So it's not going to be a real problem that you're going to overestimate something. But we want to build in correction factors for that purpose. So we're going to use the theta correction, which has been around, and it's a measure of the degree of subdivision or inbreeding or co-ancestry that, that can be seen in a population due to the um, um, substructure. substructure that exists in that group or the ancestry of particular types being more prevalent in a region or population than somewhere else. And this is, uh, again, following the um, recommendations of the National Academy of Sciences NRC2 report, which there's no reason we can't follow it again here for YSTRs, even though they talk about autosomal. Same concept applies. So we need to develop a way to do, deal with substructure effects. And we know that it's going to be low for most populations, particularly in the U.S., because as John said, there's going to be a lot more admixture of, of the populations than what we see in some of the ancestral populations, but there'll still be some effect that we want to deal with. So we ask the question is, if we had a database that was relevant and representative, we really wouldn't need to correct for substructure because it would define exactly what is occurring in, in that particular population or populations where the crime was committed, and that's what we really want to know. Typically what we have, though, is the population is relevant, say a Caucasian database, an African-American database, Hispanic databases, and so on. But it may not be absolutely representative for the area. So I might have generated one for Texas, and I'm trying to apply it to Wisconsin or something like that. So these are the ones where we probably have to deal more so with the substructure effects. And then there are situations where the population is similar but not representative. It could be where I'm using a Native American population, such as Apache or Navajo, to make some inference, but I'm dealing with a case of Algonquin Indians up in the Northeast, and you can see that you, you would say it certainly does not apply, and, but it's similar again to some of the ways that the NRC2 report dealt with the same issues. And that so if we follow the recommendations, we can come up with ways. So here's some data to start off with about how we're going to have to deal with that substructure. This was a paper done by Manfred Kaiser back in 2002 showing some data on U.S. populations where they took the minimum haplogroup uh, loci, nine loci, looked at number of different regional populations in the U.S., be it African American, Caucasian, and Hispanic, number of different individuals in each one, and they asked how, what was the haplotype diversity, and as you might expect, it's high in each group, and then the most frequent type, small percentage of them, and uh, what, was, what was the uh, number of different haplotypes in each one. 60, 70 percent. This is a little bit lower than what we showed for our studies because they only use nine loci and we use more loci. But the important thing is, is when they looked at them, we see that the European Americans, what we call Caucasian in the U.S., tend to cluster together, 
The Hispanics, even though they're from different geographic regions, tend to cluster together. And the African Americans tend to cluster together, supporting the kind of practices that have, can, have been uh, traditionally done in forensics of having major population groups like Hispanics, Caucasian, African, and so on. So that supports that there is a, a good reason to, to put these into these categories of major population groups. And if you look at the data that we've calculated, looking at what's known as an apportionment of the um, genetic variance, what's due to the variance, we see almost all of it is due to the individuals, and only a small portion is due to what we'll call the subgroups, geographic region data sets, from the data that we actually analyzed using an evolutionary model so for the, um, the degree of substructure may occur, and we'll come back to what that means. But we're seeing these in these 1% ranges, except for Native Americans, 3%, very close to what was the recommended values from the National Academy of Sciences for autosomal markers, which was a very conservative one for autosomal markers, usually an order, two orders magnitude conservative. But these are still some reasonably high values empirically, and maybe one way that we might pursue looking at them, we'll come back to that. Now, if we try to minimize the degree of evolution by not looking at all the, uh, the differences of, uh, of evolution and reducing that to what John was talking about before, that when you look at a, a sample, either it's the same type or it's different, we start to see a reduction in, in, the, um, in the degree of substructure because now we're not dealing with an evolutionary model, we're just dealing with differences, and that'll become more apparent in a little while. Um, the Europeans have done a lot of work, and they've shown that, you know, some regions there's very little difference, but across Europe, there's actually a good significant amount of inbreeding effect or substructure effect that has to be considered, and that value is, is relatively larger than that 1 or 2 percent we're seeing in some cases, and if we use that value, it actually could limit the power of testing and if that's the right value, that's what we should do. So what do I mean by that? Here is the formula we recommend for figuring out the, just the observed frequency in a data set and correcting for substructure, where P is the number, is the frequency in the data set, whatever theta value that you use to correct for that degree of substructure that might exist. So we're seeing a certain amount of diversity in the population. Now we're trying to use that observed diversity we see to extrapolate of what might be the amount of diversity in another one or the limit of what it should be. Now, that's important for us because that will be how we deal with things with um, not quite representative data set. That theta in this formula becomes the bound of the frequency very quickly because if this was 1 in 100, 1 minus p is going to be 0.99, right? 99 in 100. So basically, it's equivalent to 1. As the database gets larger, something we recommend it, which is going to make the frequency more precise and usually a much lower frequency, it's going to drive this 1 minus p closer to 1. So when that becomes 1, whatever theta is, if it's large, is going to overwhelm what the frequency is, and therefore theta becomes the value. That's the case. I don't need a database anymore. I just do theta. And if theta was 5%, just report 1 in 20 for every case, and we're done. But that may not be the best application for theta using an evolutionary model. So we have to look at what is the right value for theta, which will become eventually the limiting factor in all these. We know certain things that as you pool populations, theta goes up, and, but the most frequent profile has to go down, right? Because if it's common in one and you add in other ones that are different, this, this common one is going to become less. And we know what we've already mentioned about U.S. populations. Most of the variation is within a pop individuals in a population, not between populations that we've shown already. There are com some common haptypes tend to be the same, and we just want to know what it is if there's some substructure, what that frequency might be. So let's think about it for a second in the real world situation using models and see if we can bring the models in the real world close together. With up to 17 loci, it's possible that if I typed 100 individuals in population one, I would actually get 100 different haplotypes. We'll call them haplotype A1 through 100. And if I typed another population, either genetically very different or actually genetically very similar, homogeneous, and I type them because, again, with all these loci we have, I could actually type them and get 100 different types, and they would all be different too, whether it's homogeneous or not. And when I do that, with the kinds of database sizes we're dealing with, 
Theta is almost zero in that case because if there are no alleles in common within the data sets and there are no alleles common between them, the degree is essentially zero or close to it for practical purposes. In reality, we have this, this kind of scenario where there's a little bit of sharing in some of these and not all the alleles are A1 through 100 as we have in population 1 or A1 prime through a, A100 prime in population 2, but you may see one or two copies so that there is a little bit of sharing in these, so there is some degree, a small amount uh, contributing to theta. So theta is still going to be close to zero under this system. Now, one thing we said is each haplotype is different. We haven't said anything about how different they are, and we're going to come to that in a second. If you, another way to look at this is the things that are limiting in our approaches are we're not taking into account migration that individuals from population A could have gone to population two. We're not taking into account any uh, evolutionary patterns. And the biggie too is how do we define what is population one and what is population two? Our sampling strategy might be the result of this as well. So there are a lot of things that contribute to what we're actually seeing that might have absolutely nothing to do with the underlying parameters in the population. Okay, so beforehand we talked about the more loci typed, more haplotypes we saw. We stressed that it was really important more to deal with the database, but there could be a value in this because if we do more loci, as we see now, and we're treating them all as single locus, we're increasing and having more alleles, right, or more haplotypes. The more haplotypes, we start approaching our model of one population having all different haplotypes, another population having different haplotypes. Therefore, with the more loci, we're actually going to get reducing theta down closer and closer to zero. So there is some value in, in the more loci. And it's always going to be approaching zero. So if we're calculating under what we call, we've been alluding to, this forensic model, we'll um, do better. And so let's see what we mean by a forensic model. If I were to ask you this question, and John's already brought this up, which haplotypes would you say are more closely related in any fashion you want, evolutionary-wise or just um, so forth, which two of these are most closely related? Well, if we look at this, um, we can see that D and E are more closely related to each other than they are to A, B, and C, right? In fact, A and B are more closely related to each other than A is to C. So what does that mean when we're dealing with calculating this degree of substructure? A and B, although they are different, can actually contribute more to that theta value because they're of a similar evolutionary, probably of the same lineage, but have diverged because of mutation, okay? So we weight them as being closer related than we would if we had just A and, an A and an E in the process. So if I just had A and E, they're really different, so they don't look like they come from the same lineage and therefore, they don't contribute as much to the theta value that you might see in this population set. So from a forensic point of view, if we really want, I mean, from an evolutionary point of view, we want to calculate theta, theta is going to be larger, even though all the haplotypes are different, if there's some sort of commonality and some lineage relationship between them. But in forensics, we don't deal with it that way. In forensics, you say, I have a sample from the evidence, I have a profile from the suspect, and you say, do they match or don't they match? It doesn't matter if they're one repeat away, 10 repeats away, 20 repeats away, they either match or they don't. So in this case, all these profiles are treated equally in a forensic situation, either matches or it doesn't. It doesn't matter if A and B are closer related to each other, it would still be an exclusion. So if we look at this, if I have two samples where A was the evidence sample and C was a reference sample, what would be your interpretation in this case? Inclusion, exclusion? It would be exclusion, okay? Same thing down here, A to E would be an exclusion. Yet evolutionary-wise, A and C look much more related and A and E don't. So in, again, if we use an evolutionary model, we're gonna get a much larger theta value, which for evolutionary purposes is very important. But from a forensic standpoint, it's not being used it's really just, are they the same or different? So A, C, and E are all treated equally distant from each other 
were equally the same from each other, whichever way you want to look at it, in a forensic model. So instead of treating them as one's more related to another, we treat them as all they're equal, sort of an infinite allele model system, mm -hmm. and then we calculate theta for that. So this actually approximates more of our original model with the two populations sharing no haplotypes or very few haplotypes in common. And when you do that, theta drops down a lot, and we're in the process of calculating that value for populations now for the U.S. and for any other group who would like that. Now, we also have done some studies on mutations. We're not going to spend a lot of time on it here, but this is data from, um, from John's lab and pop, on population studies that have shown that the uh, mutation rate is what we predict for STRs and very sim similar to what we've seen and um, consistent with what's seen in other studies as well, about that 10 to the minus 3 range. And that becomes important because we can ask questions if we had two profiles that were generated um, by individuals with the hypothesis that they may be related, the other hypothesis is, well, the hypothesis is that they are related, the other one is they're not, one can ask that question by looking at the differences that exist, the number of generations they're apart, and doing a likelihood calculation between them being, um, if we had to know what the frequencies of those haplotypes are, by um, counting the number of generations, using a mutation rate value, and calculating it out of, with this formula, if they're related versus if they were unrelated, and then seeing which uh, evidence favors or supports which hypothesis. So again, by knowing something about mutation rates, we can ask certain questions to some degree. Now, we don't have the best mutation rates for every allele, but we have it for a locus in general. And this is where, you know, in, in the view of this kind of analysis, you have to take the evolutionary approach to looking at things, because what we're looking at here is two haplotypes that are different at one STR locus, and they're off by one allele, one repeat unit. Okay, and that follows a stepwise mutation model by which these alleles are actually formed. Same reason we see stutter and things like that. It's the same biological process. If these two haplotypes were different, say you had a 14, but that 13 was a 17, say, it would be much less likely that that is truly a mutation event because it would have had to take several steps to get to that approach. So they might be just two different haplotypes that are similar in many regards, and that's where the independent stuff that Bruce was talking about falls into play as well. But it's clearly not a simple matter of, oh, this mutated into that, uh, like this example here would show. And so where does that leave us in using um, substructure as a correction? What we would recommend is, and we'll, we're calculating the values as we speak, is that for most situations, the forensic calculation for theta is the right one to use. So if we have a Caucasian database and we're trying to use it to represent another, uh, sample, another area or population of Caucasians in the U.S. or African American, the different Hispanics, the forensic theta would be good. If we have some situations where we have more isolated populations where there may be, let's say, a hypothetical town where there were only three progenitors or something like that, maybe you might want to use it in that case, or in Native Americans where we don't have sufficient data sets to extrapolate as well, we probably would recommend them to use the evolutionary theta value just to be on the safe side. So another thing that is often asked is, I've run my autosomal STRs, I got a few of them, now I ran the Y STRs on the same evidence sample, can I combine the two values and treat them as if they're independent and multiply them, or because of the inheritance biological issues around the way Ys are inherited versus autosomals, are they not independent of each other? So we actually do those studies where we take the haplotype, treat it as an allele, and compare it to the loci as if they were independent or not for the autosomals. And what we find is that the amount of vari uh, we see is no more than be expected by chance in most situations. And therefore, the evidence supports to this point that multiplying them is reasonable. So that's what these data are just showing at this point. Now, the next task we have is mixtures. And um, that is something most people haven't thought about in that they're always thinking of a male in a female background 
So we're only looking at a single profile. But there are a good number of cases where there are two males in there, and it may be a mixture, and you can't separate out one male contributor from the other. So think about it. If we had 11 loci, just a subset of the possible number, and there were two alleles at each locus, I could ask you a question about how many different haplotypes are there that could possibly could be contributors to this profile. There'd be over 2,000 of those because there'd be two alleles at each locus that could pair up with each two of the next and so on down the line. 2,000 possible haplotypes, of which most of these had never been seen. Okay. Now, we could assume that they're independent and that all 2,048 could exist, but we know that there's strong linkage disequilibrium at a number of these loci. So some of these haplotypes won't even exist. No matter how much we look into the population, we'll never see them. So assuming independence is not absolutely correct to get the total number, so, and we haven't seen all of them, so we don't know what the true number is of potential haplotypes to contribute. So we want to deal with this minimal haplotype thing in the same fashion of what do we do with a minimum allele frequency approach that has been used for autosomal markers for alleles we haven't seen, and should we apply that to the mixture scenario? Well, that's not practical. If there were 2,000 different potential haplotypes, and assume all of them could exist, and we put a minimum haplotype frequency on every one of them, which would be a few percentage points just for each, we have thousands of percentage points total, which can't be more than 100. So uh, all the non-observed ones can't be treated the same way individually as a minimal haplotype frequency. So we have to think about the two ways that we can deal with mixtures and how we're going to address this. Well, we have the probability exclusion, which is one way that we thought about, the chance of pulling somebody off the street randomly and asking whether he's included or excluded as a contributor of a profile, which is a legitimate question. And we can do that using a binomial of the haplotypes excluded, haplotypes not excluded, and do it essentially the same way as the counting method. We could say, go to our database and say, is this haplotype excluded or included? In this case, let's say, cannot be excluded as a contributor of this mixed profile. So if I had 11 loci, 2 to the 11th, there'd be potentially 2,000 of them. I go to my database of, let's say, 1,000 people, and I count how many of those haplotypes cannot be excluded from being potential contributors of the sample. So let's say there's five. I say five over 1,000 and I could get a number and use, do the same thing, put an upper confidence limit on it, and I've done the same thing, correct for sampling, and I can make an estimate of the probability of exclusion or inclusion, depending on how you write the formula, to calculate out what that might be for a mixture. So very much the same way as we do the counting method now, same way as probability exclusion, and it's based on the same principles of what we already use. So it's a very simple way of dealing with it and very conservative. Now, let's think about it in a more simple fashion for the likelihood ratio, the other way that we tend to look at mixtures in calculations. So there are different hypotheses that I can entertain, and let's just deal with a two-person source. We have two suspects, two males contributing this profile. The prosecution says suspect one and suspect two are the source of this sample. They're the ones that contribute the DNA to make up this mixture. The defense says, well, suspect one is in there, but suspect two, my client, is not. Therefore, it's some random person out there, and he's just in there by chance, matching. Or the converse, suspect two is in there, and my client, suspect one, is not, not the source. It's a random person out there. Or both of them are unknowns. So these are different hypotheses we could see under the assumption that two people are contributing to this mixture. Now, let's just look at a simple thing of three loci not 11, as we did before, two alleles at each locus, and there's two male suspects, and also we have an assumption that there are two contributors. So we can ask a certain question. Can all the alleles seen in the evidence be explained by the DNA profiles of these two suspects? And we'll say they do in this case. We're going to say that the profiles of the mixture from the two contributors are equal in contribution, so we can't separate them out into major or minor or whatever. We would have eight possible haplotypes that could make up this mixture. So if you look at locus 1, 1315 are the alleles, locus 2, 810, locus 3, 22 and 25. But we don't know which alleles in which combination. 
we can then add, ask what those haplotypes are. We'll number them one through eight, but they're going to have, these are the different combinations, a 13, 8, 22, all the way up to a 15, 10, 25. Those are the possible haplotypes that cannot be excluded from this mixture. Okay, so I'm just showing these again here and putting them all onto one screen to make it easy for what we're going to do next. But here are the eight haplotypes that could possibly contribute to that mixture. But certain haplotypes as pairs cannot explain this evidence. So for example, haplotype 1 and 2 put together cannot explain the profile of a 13, 15, 8, 10, 22, 25. So reality is, is that one is not something to consider for explaining the evidence. Okay? Haplotype 1 and 3 can't explain the evidence. Haplotype 1 and 4, haplotype 1 and 5, and other combinations cannot explain the evidence. The only ones that can explain the evidence is haplotype 1 with 8, 2 with 7, 3 with 6, and 4 with 5. So there are only four pairs that have to be considered in all the possible haplotypes, combinations, for us to explain this evidence. Right. And the thing you have to remember as with any likelihood ratio, the reason behind this is you have to have your genetic data match the hypotheses that you're proposing. Okay. That, so that's the same as we've always done with mixtures, but this is a breakdown of that. Mm -hmm. That's the basis for this. And there's some real value in this over probably exclusion is because we're using more of the genetic information in a better way to get more power out of our analysis than we did probably exclusion. Because you look at probably exclusion, all eight of these, and in any combination technically, mm -hmm. are in the, in the potential in the probably exclusion. The reality is when we assume a number of contributors, we can only see certain combinations. So we're reducing the pool of candidates for calculating the probability of the evidence under a particular hypothesis. Yeah, the probability of exclusion is the probability of any one haplotype being included or excluded from these things. That's why you should never go with these one-in numbers for probability of exclusion, because it's a mixture. You never have one. You always have two or more. The likelihood ratio approach explains the data more correctly. Or, or, or more powerfully. There's nothing wrong with probably exclusion. I mean, no, you, it's the question you you're the asking, question and that's the question you're asking. But if you want to get more information out from the genetic evidence, this is a stronger way of going. So if we look at the likelihood ratio, under the hypothesis, the prosecution was that these two suspects are the source. The only way we can explain the evidence is one way, and therefore the probability of the evidence under that hypothesis is one, where we have the other possibility is that uh, under the defense hypothesis is, is that only haplotype 1 and 8, 2 and 7, 3 and 6, or actually, yeah, 2 and 7, 3 and 6, or 4 and 8, was a 4 and 5. Let me do that again for that. So we'll use it. Only 1 and 8, or 2 and 7, or 3 and 6, or 4 and 5 can explain the evidence. Okay. So if we know the frequencies of those, we can put that in. Now, it's also times two because the first suspect could have been haplotype one and the second one haplotype eight or vice versa. The first suspect could have been eight and the second one one, so we always have to consider both possibilities. Very similar to the way heterozygotes are done in the mm -hmm. normal autosomal calculations that you're familiar with. So basically, this would be the formula to use, and you can find these in textbooks and others, but there's a problem. They give you the formula, but they don't tell you how to calculate the frequency of each of these. Um, haplotypes. So, the likelihood ratio we've explained, and you can find in the literature, is technically correct, but we can't estimate the individual haplotype frequency, so we're back to square one again. If we think of 17 loci, and we had the two to seven haplotypes, there'd be a lot of possibilities. Can't explain all the combinations, but still be a lot of them, okay? So, if we also assume that independence is not correct, not all the possible haplotypes that we can uh, possibly calculate or predict will actually be there. And so we cannot just say because we think it exists, put it in the database, because we'd be putting in things with different weights, those that would, are most likely to exist because they're in particular lineages, as opposed to those that would just be assuming independence. They're not all equal. So we just can't throw them in the database, as some people have argued that if I've seen it, put it in there. or if not, because you say, if I've seen it, you're weighting a particular hypothesis over all the others, and that may not be correct.
So the best thing to do is to use the same logic as we just did for probability of exclusion is we have certain uh, ways of looking at it. We have a haplotype, and just as we did in probability of exclusion, the haplotype either can be included or excluded. So under the probability of exclusion, there were eight possible haplotypes. Uh, all other possible haplotypes were excluded, and there were these eight that could not be excluded. And then we can say in pairs what would happen. So if I have two that were excluded together, certainly can't explain the evidence right in a mixture, because if the first one's excluded and the second one's excluded, they won't have the alleles that explain any of the evidence. I could also have a situation where I have a haplotype that's excluded as being a contributor of the profile, and I have other ones that cannot be excluded, and if I did those in pairs, they would also be excluded in pairs because it could explain all the alleles in the evidence. So the only scenario is, is where we have haplotype that cannot be excluded and another haplotype not can be excluded and they're paired together. But as we saw with our eight that we showed before, only a subset of those actually worked. And that was one and eight, two and seven, three and six, and four and five. All other combinations, one and two, one and three, and one and four, could not explain the evidence. So we're only looking at a subset of the pairs of haplotypes that cannot be excluded in the evidence. So what do we do? We figure out what those are that can explain the evidence in pairs, and we then look at all the pairwise combinations in our data set. So what do I mean by that? I can say, take a, a population database of 100 individuals, 1,000 individuals, whatever it is, and ask the question, if I pair up every possible combination, individual one with two, individual one with three, four, five, up to 100, then individual two with three, two with four, so on, all the way up to and so on, I can then say I have all the possible pairwise in my database and ask the question, of those, which pairs can explain the evidence, potentially, mm -hmm. okay? So I can count that, which we call M star in this case, over the total number of possible combinations in my data set, then again do the same thing. These are the ones I've observed, take an upper confidence limit of that for sampling correction for the ones I haven't observed, and we can calculate what would be the best approach for mixtures. So basically, in a likelihood ratio, well, I mean, we can calculate what is the problem. Actually, what it is is the probability of inclusion, given the evidence and the hypothesis of defense with an assumed number of contributors. Okay? Um, this is the, would be the likelihood ratio of that. Remember, the hypothesis under the prosecution is there's only one way to explain the evidence. It's one. This would be what it would be under the defense with one or two or so on, depending on the number of hypotheses that you have. So the denominator really is very much the same as probability of inclusion with an assumed number of contributors. A lot of people have trouble looking at the likelihood ratio because they're afraid of what it means or how to express it. But really what we have here is, is it's, it's just waiting, it's looking at the probabilities of, of the evidence under different hypotheses, although they may be hard to think of, as you can also say this, the hypothesis by the prosecution is explained by, you know, all the alleles that we see in the uh, suspects, it's explained under that hypothesis. And the defense is saying that there are two individuals that are contributing to this, but neither of them are people in this courtroom, they're just somebody out there, and the probability of that is the probability of inclusion for the number. So you can actually just say the probability of the evidence under that hypothesis is one in a thousand, one in ten thousand, or whatever it may be, and I think you'd be just as fine. So there's lots of ways to explain this evidence. But the main thing is the likelihood ratio makes better use of the data. The probability of exclusion is a valid statistical estimate. It's a good estimate. It's an easier one to explain and understand. But under this particular approach with mixtures, they're really not that different. They're very, very similar. Now, there are database, uh, databases out there, applied biosystems, Promega, Reliagene, uh, Europeans have groups, and there are lots of different ways to, um, to access data for populations. But I may say one thing. You're going, to, you're going to show you some of that now, but you can't do mixtures at this point because it doesn't allow you to search the possibilities in an effective manner. So if we had just the eight haplotypes as an example, we'd have to type in all eight individually. And that was just with three loci. If we had 11 loci, we'd have to type in all 2,048 possibilities, search, and of course no one's going to do that without an automated system. And if it's the pairwise mixture one for the likelihood ratio, 
the databases right now don't have the tools to do the pairwise mixing. So we can only deal with single source samples at this point. But now that we've defined the approach, the software can be written. All right. This is just an example here of uh, the Y filer database. That's the one that has the most number of loci. And it's very user friendly. And as Bruce was mentioning, all what it can be really used for is you type in the haplotype you got from a particular evidentiary item, and it will tell you if it has seen that haplotype in the database, and if so, how many times. And also, it'll break it down by which population group. Uh, those particular haplogroup group haplotypes were found in. Uh, so here's just the entry screen, uh, the Promega website, similar to this. Um, I don't remember looking at Relia genes in quite a long time, but you know these are mechanisms. There's also international databases you can find on the web for the U European search engine. There are some universities that also have Y databases. Now their loci might not necessarily be the same ones that you're using and the kits that you're using. Uh, and all of them have different database sizes uh, assigned to them. So uh, here's just a data entry screen. You, you have pull down windows. You add the particular allele calls to it. So say we had this uh, particular profile that we got from the Y filer kit. You can see it's a single source profile, no brainer. It's a single individual. You record those particular allele calls into the database search engine in this manner. So you see all the boxes are filled out the way they need to be, and you push go. Okay? So, of course, you know, like what we've been saying the whole time, every time you pull some individual's haplotype, you type a sample, most of the time it's not going to be in the database. And you can see that, you know, right here in this instance. You know, that was just, you know, nobody in particular is haplotype floating around there, but if you look at all of the databases, and that's our 3,561 that the database had at the, at the moment that this was run, we haven't seen this haplotype before. Okay, and when you're doing your casework, you're going to find out that this is what you're going to see most of the time. Okay, so that doesn't really tell us very much. So what do you have to do? You have to calculate basically your upper bound confidence interval on zero counts using the formula that we had proposed before. And there's our number of haplotypes. Now I'm doing it in this manner here, looking at just the total number of haplotypes in the database. Okay? And in that case there, the particular upper bound frequency assigned to this haplotype would be 0 .00084. Okay? So that's looking at the whole database as a picture. It's not breaking it out by population group, which of course you would want to do as well. That would give you relevance to each individual uh, database. But you have to think about it in another sense too. The profile you put in there was of the evidentiary item. So what population group are you going to say the evidentiary item is? You know, so there's pros and cons to both of those approaches. So why don't we pick another haplotype? Here's a haplotype that's actually in the database. Surprise, surprise. Uh, it's actually in there, but only in there twice happens to show up twice in the Caucasian database. And in this particular instance, it does actually give us a point frequency. It's seen twice in the database of 3,561, or if you're looking at it by population group, twice in a database of 1,276. It gives you the point frequency based on the population group or the point frequency based on the overall database. So you have both numbers at your disposal there. But this is the point frequency estimate. It's that X number we talked about before. What you'd want to do is take that then and then apply an upper bound confidence interval, 95% interval, for instance, to give your estimate and a more unbiased estimate of it. So if we look at the Caucasian there and we use the formula that we had up there before incorporating the confidence interval, you know, you have to decide which P to use and which N to use, whether you're going to do it by population group or total. You know, so if we're looking at all of them, like we did in that previous example, you know, we'd use the 3561. That would give us an upper bound interval of about 0 .0014. You know, if we wanted to base it on the Caucasian group. Now, remember, with the Caucasian group, if you're going to use this approach and truly stick with the way we've been doing it, 
with uh, the autosomal STRs, you wouldn't only calculate the Caucasian, but you'd have to count the zero in whatever the number is for African American, Hispanic, and so on, and report all three frequencies. So you'd have to consider that. Uh, there are numbers for Caucasian where we're actually going to do something with it, and the upper bound would be 0 .00379. So again, this is not a very difficult thing to do. It's a very simplistic approach, and it, it works very reliably. And it's basically identical to what we're doing with mitochondrial DNA for uh, the last, what, about eight years, nine years maybe, ten years. Uh, so um, these uh, databases are available. Um, they're pretty easy to use. Again, as Bruce mentioned, they're not going to help us very much in terms of mixture. We don't have any mixture statistics tools available, available that'll give us, like was mentioned, with 17 STR loci, two possible contributors, there's a very large number of possible combinations that you could have. There are only a certain subset of those are the relevant combinations of individuals, but you'd have to sit there and do that manually, which might take you better part of two or three or four days a week, you know, uh, to actually sit down and figure out. Uh, so it's not a very practical thing to do. Um, None of them have mixture capabilities, as does pop stats at this time. There's no uh, Y tools whatsoever in, in any of the code of software for that. So doing 17 loci like we'd like to do wouldn't be very much fun. Um, so what did we cover? Well, we talked about interpretation, how to get to where we were actually going to go. Talked about the selection process of the loci, issues of haplotypes, independence, the lack thereof mutations and how they might play a role, substructure and the issues that we're still working on with that, mixtures, how to deal with them, and how to deal with the reference databases to get us some frequency estimates. And hopefully that was informative. Thank you very much.